Welcome to Gabbing About Gardening, everyone. Thank you for joining us today on this gorgeous day, at least on Cortez Island, where I'm coming from. Gabbing About Gardening is a weekly gabbing session with gardeners from all around the world. Today, we are so honored to have Brigitte Mars with us, gabbing about get off your grass and create an edible lawn, especially grow healing plants. And Brigitte will start her presentation in just a few minutes. My name is Lucretia. I go by Lou. I'm coming at you from Cortez Island in the Salish Sea of British Columbia. We are close to 30 degrees here, which I think is about 80 degrees in the U.S. version, Brigitte. Is it really warm where you are in Boulder? Oh, today we have a little break, but it's been hot. But yeah. we're growing a lot of stuff. Well, which is another really good reason to be focused on the presentation that you're going to make today, because um, a couple of weeks ago, Excuse we me. had one of the world's foremost bee experts, Dr. Mark Winston, talking to us about the importance of weeds and biodiversity when it comes to bees and pollinators. So that's very exciting. Welcome everybody. Thanks for joining us. We'll get started in a few minutes. I'm gonna tell you just a little bit about Brigitte Mars and I'm gonna start with something personal. I first met Brigitte in Boulder, Colorado in the early 80s and I was immediately drawn to her fabulous energy, open-heartedness and her knowledge about plants was unlike anyone I had ever met before but it wasn't just head knowledge. It is heart knowledge, it's soul knowledge. And when Brigitte talks about plants, and you'll see what I mean in just a few minutes, she's coming from a place that is truly, truly connected to Mama Earth. And Brigitte is a master herbalist, a nutritional consultant. She teaches all around the world has been on radio shows everywhere, has written how many books now, Brigitte? Well I'm, over 12. Uh, 14 now. <laughs> <laughs> 14 beautiful books uh, that really teach us the medicinal value of plants. Brigitte, thank you for being with us today on Gabbing About Gardening. We're really appreciative of you taking your time to share your knowledge with us. I am turning it over to you now. It's my pleasure and honor. And um, I don't know if you can make the, this meeting is being recorded thing go away. It's right in the middle of my screen. Maybe you don't see it. It's, uh, it's in the upper left corner of my screen. It's not on yours. I'm so sorry about that. That must be distracting. That's okay. Well, uh, welcome everyone. Uh, Lucretia, maybe you could just tell me how long we have so I can pace myself. We go until five o'clock and usually our guest teacher will do a presentation until for about 45 minutes. Okay. And then we open it up for questions and discussion. Perfect. That sounds great. Yeah, and I'll let you be in charge of uh, admitting people as they come in. Yes, so and I will also manage the chat box and manage those questions unless something pops up and you want to address it directly. It would probably be best if you tell me what the questions are because I don't think I'm going to be able to see them if I'm doing a PowerPoint. Okay. Well, welcome everyone. Uh, it is so dear to have the opportunity to work with my dear friend, Lou. Um, one thing she did not tell you is I have a daughter named Rainbow Harmony, and she has one named Harmony Rainbow. Uh, what are the chances of that? And they were in the same, I think, sixth grade for a while. So, 
and um, her son Justin was good friends with my daughter Sunflower. So I do have a child with an herbal name, and um, I'm very delighted to be here because I really do think that, you know, when we look at our planet, we can say, boy, the world is really in a mess, you know, oh, it's really terrible, but then we have to focus on the solutions. And every day we have an opportunity to choose to be part of the solution rather than just, you know, watching the news and lamenting about how cray cray it is. And I do feel that, you know, we can all grow something, um, even if it's just on our balcony or our porch. And uh, I wanna share with you that I, am, I live in downtown Boulder, Colorado, and I live in a condo right downtown. And so what we're doing here is really trying to get people to think about um, solutions. And a big one is stop using pesticides. So I know you're all gardeners and hopefully you're doing it or organically. So um, the title, Get Off Your Grass and Create an Edible Lawn is based on a story I wrote for Huffington Post. And uh, it was published and it's still online. So you can Google, get off your grass and create an edible lawn. You know, if you want to get on grass, uh, we could, that can be another d topic. But we're talking about that lawn grass that's in the grass family, the Poaceae. So we begin here to just explore possibilities. So um, I, I feel strongly that, you know, the dandelion has been much maligned and it's said that the average American recognizes over a thousand products and the logos that they're associated with and yet they recognize perhaps maybe not you all but you know average and excuse me I realize a lot of you are probably Canadian I'm kind of Canadian too my ancestry is from Bay St. Paul north of Quebec and I grew up a lot of my life there je parle français aussi but in any case, one of the five herbs that many people recognize is the dandelion. And unfortunately, they think, oh, God, dandelion's got to get rid of them. And so the dandelion is actually one of the top five most nutritious vegetables on the face of the planet. It was brought here deliberately by the pioneers. No, it's not native, but neither are most of us, right? Even the Native Americans are said to have come somewhere. So don't worry about the native thing so much, you know? Like it is the nature of nature to move across this beautiful planet. So the, the Latin name for dandelion is Taraxicum officinal, which means the remedy for the disorder. And uh, farmers often know that a good place to put the garden is where the dandelions grow. Dandelions actually help aerate the soil. So by having dandelions in your yard, they're helping to aerate the soil. What could be wrong with that? And there's this myth out there that dandelions kill the grass. And I'm here to tell you, the dandelions don't kill the grass. The, the, the truth is, is that the grass is going to die if it doesn't get enough water. But dandelions are a Jedi survival plant. They grow despite people trying to kill them. They just come up. Nobody plants them, they still come up. Nobody waters them, they thrive. And it's really more like the grass is going to die when it gets too hot and too dry. But the dandelion is going to plod along a lot longer. So, um, you know, I, I'm going to share with you after I do this presentation, a little song that my partner has written about dandelions, but every part of the dandelion is useful. You can eat the leaves. They are most tender in the spring before the plant flowers. Uh, traditionally in the Jewish tradition, dandelion leaves were one of the original bitter herbs of Passover to commemorate the bitterness of being enslaved. Uh, dandelion leaves are very diuretic, meaning they increase kidney function. And if you've ever had to take a chemical diuretic, what happens, an intelligent physician will say, we need to give you potassium because chemical diuretics deplete the body of potassium. But not dandelions, they give you potassium. The dandelion flowers are edible and they're high in lutein, which is really good for our eyes. 
So what do you do with dandelion flowers? I put them in salad. I put them in honey. I put them in smoothies. Uh, you can buy a bottle of lutein for $30, your choice. But you could also eat things like dandelions, calendula, marigold, and sunflower petals. They're all high in lutein. Uh, the dandelion stem, you can boil it in water for a couple minutes. I like to do this with the young tender stems. Boil them in water and then drain, strain them in a colander and saute them with some garlic and butter or coconut, coconut oil or olive oil. And uh, one of my daughters had some warts on her knees. So I said, you take the sap from the dandelion stem and put it on those warts and they will go away. It took five days. No doctor appointment needed. And then the dandelion root, you can dig that up and then clean them well, scrub them with a little like carrot scrubbing brush and then saute them or you could um, marinate them with tamari, olive oil, but the dandelion roots are really good for your liver. And in Asian medicine, it's said that old stored emotions are stored in the liver. So if you're someone who's like, you know, dwelling in the past and sad about all this stuff, you got to let go of all that. Maybe you want to make a tea of dandelion root or a dish out of dandelion root. And I bet a lot of you have um, had dandelion root tea made from the roasted root. So there's nothing wrong with this plant. It's amazing. It's, you know, and it grows so easily. So maybe we should make use of it rather than treating as an enemy. And the most important thing is that dandelions are one of the first foods for the bees in the springtime. So when we eradicate the dandelions or put rocks over them or dig them up or get rid of them, we are part of the problem, not the solution. So we're here to talk about solutions and that's why I'm so honored to be here. So um, I wanna move this thing here. So um, <clears throat> plants for, I don't, I can't see what it says there. Lucretia, what's it say? It's covered up for me. It says 10 beautiful plants for a low water landscape. Okay, thank you. So, you know, different plants are gonna thrive better in different landscapes, but the truth is, is that many of the so-called weeds, which we've been conditioned to disdain, actually thrive well with very little uh, water. But um, Echinacea is a great xeriscape plant. Uh, sink foil is another great one. Uh, you, this is something you might ask about at your local farmer's markets. I always ask, tell people like, you know, find out what's appropriate for your area. And of course we want to group the low water plants together. Um, that's going to be easy. And um, so it's really an opportunity to put out, you know, plants that are going to help the pollinators and uh, it, you know, it takes a little thought. I actually uh, designed a garden in our inner courtyard according to feng shui, which, you know, is the art of placement. So I like to honor um, all of the different aspects of our life, which includes career, community, wealth, reputation, relationship, children and creativity, helpful people and travel, and then health. So I don't want to make this about feng shui, but if you like the idea of feng shui, you can even design your garden according to the colors <clears throat> and the aspects and the functions of the different plants uh, you're going to put there. So uh, roses, I just made a great big salad and you know, roses are edible and uh, roses are said to open our heart center and promote feelings of love and empathy. So I, I love, uh, growing fragrant roses and I'm going to a potluck tonight so the potluck is mostly lamb's quarter with a bunch of roses in there and um, of course, as long as the roses are not sprayed with toxic pesticides and this also means that you're not going to use the flowers that come from floral shops or that are imported from you know foreign continents where they might even be using things that are banned in North America, so we have to be really careful of that. But, um, you know, roses, as I said, are said to open your heart center, promote feelings of love, empathy, and forgiveness. And then in the fall, you get rose hips, 
which not only contain some vitamin C, they contain something called bioflavonoids, which helps you to assimilate vitamin C. And so I collected a lot of rose hips this fall, and it was a little bit of project because I cut them in half, took out the seeds, scattered the seeds um, outside, and then I made rose hip fruit cake and rose hip chutney. Uh, so there's a lot of things you can do with the rose hips, rose hip tea, rose hip scones, rose hip uh, soup, very pr uh, popular in Scandinavia. So roses. So uh, this looks a little bit like, uh, you know, just, you know, uh, one book I read that was very inspirational to me was The One Straw Revolution by Fukuyama, maybe. I, I may be not getting that name quite right, but it's written by a Japanese author. <clears throat> and so my garden is a little bit wild, kind of like me. You know, I'm the child of the 60s, a little bit wild. And I don't plant everything in rows. If there's a little open space, like, oh, let's stick some basil seeds in there. Or let's put a zucchini or something didn't come up. So I um, am not like, you know, following everything in rows. I am uh, opportunistic. I'm looking for an open space. And I, I just want to say again, I live in a condo. I do not own the place where I garden but I do it anyways. As a matter of fact, I grow stuff on the sidewalk. My, I do own my porch and balcony, so I grow things there. I do have compost bins, but I also am sort of like a pirate. I don't go and steal things. I go out and plant things early in the morning with a shovel, and I plant things on different areas where there's a little patch of something, like like the median, I planted a peach tree across the street. I put a mulberry tree across the street. And I'm gonna tell you a little secret. If you put some like rocks or bricks around it, people assume somebody planted it there and they leave it alone. It's really a brilliant setup. And then also down the block, I saw that there were some raised bed gardens that were getting watered at this apartment complex, but nobody planted anything there. Well, I just said, hey, I'm just going to go put some seeds here, let them water, and see what happens. So that's amazing. I love being, a, a, you know, like a sort of a lawn pirate, like putting things there that will grow and feed people. And I was in Germany a few years ago, and I noticed that in one block there would be plum trees, peach trees, uh, apple trees, crab apple trees, pear trees. I mean, what a great gift to the planet to be able to plant things uh, that could be used for the future and for other people. So one plant that I'm really gung-ho on, and I know it'll thrive well in Canada because it does grow very well in Alaska, and that is serviceberry, also known as juneberry, the Latin name amelichior, and there's several species out there. But um, what is so cool about this plant, I, you know what, I, I can't really see it. I think, I, I think this is service berry right here. It looks like Oregon grape, though. I'm sorry, I, there, I've got this thing in front of it. Oh, well, this is service berry right here. Okay. Well, never mind. I'm, I'm going back here. This is Oregon grape. Yes. So I'm going that's back to right. Oregon grape. It is Oregon it's, grape. It's, there's a little um, something in front of my picture, so I'm having doing it. But Oregon grape, um, which is a state flower of Oregon, um, has edible berries that are very sour and that are good for the liver. And then the flowers are edible, and it's actually a great bee pollinator. So think of Oregon grape as a great landscaping plant, uh, great for xeriscape. It doesn't require much water, helps the bees. And then the root of Oregon grape is one of the great antimicrobial agents. Uh, it contains an alkaloid called berberine, which is also found in an endangered herb called golden seal, uh, but Oregon grapefruit is not endangered, so you could use that as an antimicrobial, which includes antiviral, antibacterial, and antifungal. Okay, so this is the famous service berry, Amelichior. So I really think that if you've got a little bit of space, um, plant an, a service berry or a June berry. Um, Sarvis berry is another name. It was a very, very important food and hopefully still is to native populations. And it's in the rose family. 
and it grows uh, very easily. It won't produce berries the first year. But um, what's so nice about this plant, uh, we got about a gallon off of a cup off for one bush this morning. We got up really early and went and collected about a gallon of them. And um, they, they are very wonderfully, you know, high yield. And they don't have thorns like those blackberries. And they don't have seeds that you have to take out like the rose hips. And so it was just so wonderful. And, you know, I'm really big on eating more blue colored foods, blueberries, June berries. If I buy potatoes, I'm gonna buy uh, blue or purple potatoes. If I buy cornmeal, I'm gonna buy blue corn because I wanna support plants that are closer to their uh, genetic um, individuality rather than being heavily hybridized. I really think, you know, this tendency of uh, finding our food to be seedless, seedless grapes, seedless watermelon, seedless oranges. Well, uh, I really just encourage gardeners to purchase heirloom seeds that will produce seeds so you can collect your own seeds. But the seeds of plants are good for our reproductive system. So I realize like not all of us are concerned about our reproductive systems at this point, but you know, if we keep making all our food seedless, then the handmaid's tale will be true. And you know what? It's probably gonna be true anyways, not to scare you, but you know, you've all heard like, oh, sperm count is down and pesticides are one of the many, many factors, radiation, on and on and on. So support some of these like native plants and service berry is a native plant that will thrive well in a cold area. And one of the good things about it, you know, being a, a shrub in the rose family, it's gonna come back year after year and it doesn't take up a lot of space. So I find this to be really uh, amazing plant. So another small shrub, of course, some things, a shrub is classified as a tree that's under 10 years, 10 feet tall, <laughs> that can, uh, has a single trunk, okay? And then a shrub uh, is usually under 10 years, 10 feet tall. However, there are some plants that, you know, given the right conditions might be taller than a shrub. All right, but we won't worry about that too much. So elder is another plant that I really love a lot. Uh, so elder sambucus, uh, we could say sambucus canadensis, which is native to Canada. Uh, there's also sambucus nigra. So if you're going to buy an elder, you want to buy one that's going to produce blue or black berries. There's a little saying in the elder world, uh, blue is true and red is dead. So we don't want to eat the red elderberries, okay? But the elder flowers are a great remedy for fever. They are diaphoretic, meaning they increase sweating. And so the herbal way, if like if you have a fever, it doesn't take an aspirin and go to bed because aspirin cools you down. What aspirin does is it keeps the fever inside you. Uh, not smart in the herbal tradition. The herbal way is use herbs that make you sweat so you eliminate toxins and fever through your skin. Um, so I know there's a lot of talk I don't want to get censored, but that, you know, CV thing that like we've been hearing is going around. Um, it's really the elder flower that's even better because it can help lower a fever, um, but not by suppressing it, by making you sweat. And then the elder berries are delicious. They are edible. But the blueberries, again, blue or black, they are also antiviral. There was a study done in Israel done by Madame Mamglushu, I know, because the first book I wrote was called Elder, Small Tree, Big Medicine. Um, but she did a study at a Israeli kibbutz and found that when people had colds and flus, you give them elderberry syrup, and it reduces the symptoms to two days rather than a week to 10 days. I'll go with that. But I use elderberries to make pie and syrup, uh, schnapps. Uh, it's our number one a uh, cold remedy, you know, that we have a little shot of elderberry schnapps when you're feeling under the weather before bed, you just sleep so well. And, you know, I teach every year in Iceland and I want to tell you something, you cannot pay an Icelandic person to cut an elder tree down. You know, my host would always say, look at this, see this road, see this road? 
Look, then the road goes like this. Why do you think that is? I says, because there's an elder tree there. They, they believe that the elder trees are a condominium for nature spirits, which we might consider like midway creatures or something. But in any case, I don't know if you believe in nature spirits or not, but hey, we can use all the help we can get. So bring on the nature spirits. But my friend Herbal Ed, he likes to say elder trees are a condominium for devas or nature spirits. And you know what? Tonight is the first night of summer. Rumor has it if you sleep under an elder tree, you may be blessed to be able to visit the fairy realm. I don't know, but I might try that tonight. Of course, I'll be sleeping on the sidewalk, so I better like bring a friend or something. Okay, so we've got elderberries. Um, you know, there's a lot of folklore about elder, um, you know, being, I, I'm going to say, you know, bringing good fortune. In Russian folklore, they say that, you know, if you have an elder tree by your house, you will be blessed to be able to die in your own home, I guess, like, rather than, like, you know, at the mall or something. Uh, what else about elder? Um, they are just very versatile. So the leaves are not edible, but you've got edible flowers, which could be put in muffins. You can make an elderflower champagne and a delicious berry in the fall. Um, I would suggest cooking the elder unless you want a very laxative effect, but you can also dry the elderberries and make a wonderful tea with them as well. And they don't take up much room. Again, it's really a shrub. So, you know, many of us, uh, you know, who don't have lots and lots of land might be growing things in containers, and that is a great thing to do. I find that you know, cherry tomatoes. Here in Colorado, I'm more likely to grow cherry tomatoes because they'll probably have a chance to ripen rather than, you know, still be green when we have the first frost. But um, there's many books on container gardening. And, you know, it's just really a joy. We are in a drought. I think a lot of places are in a drought right now. So I am giving my bath water since I just use a few, a little bit of you know, essential oil in my bath or a squirt of Dr. Bronner's peppermint soap, and then I give the water back to the plants, okay? I really think we need to be more respectful with water, um, you know, and if you're watering your garden, think about watering early in the day or in the late, you know, late as possible. Okay, here we go again. So companion planting, we all know that, you know, it's, uh, roses love garlic and there's some things that like to be around each other. Who knows why? I mean, who knows the mind of the plants? Maybe it's that they, you know, benefit from different minerals or different pollinators that are there. But it is worth to pay attention to, you know, put the friends together. Just like, you know, in school, you want to sit with your friends, right? You're going to do better if you get to hang out with your friends. You're going to like school more. And we want our plants to like being in the garden. So if you provide their friends for them, everybody's going to be happy. So this is pretty serious here. Right now, I don't know about Canada, but in the U.S., we are currently using 30% of our nation's water <clears throat> to water grass. And unless you are a goat, I, I don't see any goats there, or, or sheep, or, or cows, but unless you're a goat, you're probably not eating the grass, right? Um, so the, the whole concept of the American lawn, or the European lawn, because it really started in Europe, was started by the British aristocracy. And it started in the late 1880s, and it was really a way of showing off one's affluence. So if you had a lawn that was suitable for nothing more than, you know, uh, badminton or croquet, maybe you had a rose bush or something, but it was a way that people would drive by and say, oh, they must be so rich. Look at that. They must have servants go to the market for them. Oh, they must have the doctor bring them leeches when they're sick. Oh, you know, rather than those like chamomile tea that grandma used to give. And of course, I still give. All right, but 30% of our nation's water in, in the U.S. goes to water lawns. And we know California is in a drought. A lot of places are, you know, my maybe some of you said this too, but my father always used to say, the wars of today are being fought for oil. The wars of the future will be fought for water. And, you know, we do see the privatization of water already. I know when I was pregnant with my daughter, Sunflower, about, 
I don't know, like 50 years ago. Um, yeah, it was that long ago. She told me, uh, no, somebody told me, no, she was just a baby. She, someone said um, in, that someday you're going to have to pay for water, drinking water. And I said, that'll never happen. You're not going to have to pay for drinking water. It just comes out of the tap. It's fine. And they said, yeah, just you wait. And I work in a holistic pharmacy, and I will tell you, the number one thing we sell is bottled water. You know, people come in, and we've seen the pictures on Facebook probably of the travesty of the piles of plastic that we think are being recycled, and they're not really. The, and, you know, a lot of those countries that we're taking our plastic recycled, they're not taking them anymore. We're going to have to figure out what to do with it, and that means we better really figure out how not to use so much of it. All right, so this is serious business. Uh, so, pesticides and herbicides, what are we doing here? The word side means kill. It means to make it dead. Spermicide, herbicide, pesticide, uh, you know, uh, fungicide, they're designed to kill things. Okay, and when you see somebody like spraying your food wearing a hazmat suit, that ought to tell you something. But I know, I trust that you're all organic gardeners and doing the right thing, because that really is part of the solution. Um, so the, the lawn, is it, you know, it's become almost like a thing of competition. And one of the things we really need to look at is these archaic homeowners associations that have all these rules like, oh, you can't grow food here. You can only grow grass because grass is fancy and civilized and water intensive. Well, we need to change that because that is so outdated. Um, so the homeowners associations, you know, they want you all to have your house like the same color. I always think of those, that song you might remember, little boxes, little boxes, and they're all made out of ticky tacky. Yeah, like that. And then they have these like, you know, plastic uh, astroturf lawns. But if it weren't enough that we were using so much water to water lawns, uh, then think about the amount of gasoline that's used to cut down the lawns. So I realize some of you might want to have some lawn area for throwing frisbee or picnicking. So one of the things we can do <coughs> is let the grass grow a little taller. We could leave the grass clippings on the ground to help fertilize our soil. We could use a uh, what is it, uh, a, m a mower that's not, like it's not uh, gas powered. I don't know what they're called. Electric mower or non-power mower. So you could do that. <clears throat> do you like being woken up at uh, 8 o'clock Sunday morning with a lawn mower, a weed whacker, uh, what's the other one, a leaf blower? I'm sure the fairies don't like it. It's just like really, really noisy. And there was actually a study that an 80-year-old woman with a broom can clear as many leaves as one of those leaf blowers. So, and that's not even considering all the gasoline that's used for those lawnmowers, okay? So a lot of gas. I wonder who was behind that. I think these were really, really evil things we were taught, like kill the dandelions, don't grow any food in your yard, spray poisons, I wonder who owns that, and then buy our gas. Okay, and then you've got to use gas to go buy the gas, and that's even more gas. And, you know, there are people who, like, get injured. I do know someone who cut his toe off with a lawn mower. He, he actually did that on purpose so he wouldn't have to go to Vietnam, but that was a long time ago. Okay. So, okay, so this is kind of wasteful too. Like, you know, if you are leaves, leaf, you know, the, leave the leaves alone because the leaves also are great mulch. They actually help to fertilize your yard. And um, I actually go get leaves from other places and put them on top of my garden. And they always say, rather than raking the leaves, you really should leave them there till um, later in the spring because a lot of, pollinators will overwinter there. So we just want to think about that. At least these are paper bags that could be recycled, but you know, could they be put in your compost? And I'm talking not only about leaves, but also about, 
the grass clipping. So the creator's given us some really great things and somehow we've, you know, well, we're not going to do that. We're just going to like go buy, uh, you know, mulch and a bag from the store when we probably already have a lot. Okay. So this is a proverb. I heard this when I was 15 years old. If you have water to throw away, throw it on a plant. And I've always remembered this. Um, it's really important because I just see how much water we're wasting. And what if everybody had a basin in their sink? You know, a basin and they collected that water that was used to rinse a dish or rinse an apple from the store or because if, if it's from my yard, I won't rinse it. I actually really want the MSM, that little powdery blush that's on the fruit. Um, but I really think we need to rethink water so several times a day i have the full basin in my sink and i just open the door the kitchen door and i give it to a basil plant or a hollyhock or or something or mint or something like that so it's just a way of thinking because i'll tell you we use as much in one flush as many people around the world will use for their whole day of drinking and bathing and hygiene and food preparation so we got to share, you know, we got, we can't only think about me, me, me. We got to think about what, how are we going to like equalize this playing field on planet earth? So the other proverb I really love is the best time to plant a tree is 20 years ago. The next best time is now. I think this might actually be from the Jewish tradition, but whoever, whoever said it, it's great. So, um, Again, sometimes we think, well, I'm not going to live here forever. It's just an apartment. I'm going to move in two years. But wouldn't it be great if you moved into a place and they had an old apple tree or a pear tree? <clears throat> and if you're going to plant a tree, why not plant something that is going to bear fruit? A, a beautiful movie you might enjoy. Um, it's a movie and a book. It's called The Man Who Planted Trees, based on a true story of a man who reclaimed much of the French you know, countryside just planting acorns. Now granted, acorns are edible, important native uh, food, but in any case, um, you might enjoy that movie. Oh, I wanted to say, there's also a Hans Christian Andersen story about elder trees. It's called The Elder Tree Mother. So next time you have uh, grandchildren over, maybe you want to read The Elder Tree Mother to them. Yeah, I, I love, I kind of collect herbal tales and legends so I can tell them. So fortunately, our uh, state has legalized collecting uh, gray water, although I did it before it was legal, but what else is new? I mean, really? The water that comes from the sky, I can't collect that. I'm just going to put some buckets on the porch, but now I can be a little more blasé about it, like having a big barrel. I usually put the lid on it when it's not, um, you know, collecting water because I don't want it to be a breeding ground for mosquitoes. But, you know, this is another way of just treating the water with respect. And I really think we're going to be forced to do it, so we might as well start doing it and learning how to do it while, um, you know, while we can. All right. And I love the rainwater. It, I know you gardeners have noticed rainwater is a gift from the heavens. It really is. And fluoridated water with chlorine in it, it's okay. It does the job, but boy, there's something after a good rain, how the plants really smile. And I'm going for that. So of course, uh, you know, composting, I have two compost bins. One's actively being filled and one is actively kind of uh, decomposing. We want to water our compost. We want to turn them. We w this is a good place. I tell the neighbors, put your grass clippings in here, okay? Um, so you can get little red worms, order them online. You can do it in an apartment. But it's a way of being conscientious of giving back to the earth rather than just taking, taking, taking. It's really like a prayer. It's like everything is like, I want to honor this beautiful planet that we've been given. And how can I do that? How can I not just be someone who takes and takes, but gives back? And, you know, I really love the idea that when I leave this planet, there's going to be like thousands of stinging nettle patches because I'm a big stinging nettle advocate. Um, and every year I give a hundred rooted nettle plants away. 
Maybe I'll get to talk about nettles in a little bit here. Okay, so food and yard waste. Yes, you know what you can put in the compost. We don't have a lot of animal products. Um, so since it's such a rare thing, I'll put them in. But yeah, I just think it's such a cool thing to do. How could we have wasted that? So if you do have to uh, have a lawn because of homeowners association or something, uh, rather than growing grass, a uh, white Dutch clover or trifolium repens is uh, another suitable thing to plant because it only grows maybe three or four inches tall and it produces a little flower that does provide pollination from for the bees and other pollinators. But it also being a, a Fabaceae family member or pea family member, it fixes nitrogen into the soil. So growing a clover would be a good thing to do no matter what, whether you ever plan on gardening there. But um, I see that it's sort of a win-win because it's not too tall. You can picnic there, play frisbee, uh, and then you can, uh, you know, then you you could, you know, eat it. But it's um, it's in the pea family, so some of those things can give you gas if you eat them too much. But, like, don't we eat snap peas and sugar peas and lentils so so white dutch clover i also um think other good lawn covers if you have to have a short lawn i think of things like thyme i think of uh self heal or prunella vulgaris i think of uh i actually think purslane is a wonderful thing to have as a ground cover it was gandhi's favorite food like how did it ever get to be an enemy it's really high in omega-3 fatty acids. Um, violets are another great one for a ground cover because violets, you can eat the leaves. They have a long tradition of being used as an anti-cancer herb and then the violet flowers are also edible. So these could be alternatives of things that grow low if you don't want you know, gardening or you don't want um, things too tall or at least for part of your area. So uh, it's good to learn what are your friends and allies in the garden. Um, you know, I love bees, and it is legal in our, in our county to have bees, even, you know, downtown area. Um, but I also want to say the wasp I don't like so much, only because they sting repeatedly and they kind of scare the bees, and they're, I don't know, I, maybe I should learn to love them. I'm sure they're pollinators too. But a little trick if you don't want the wasp to make a nest in your house is to take a paper bag and kind of blow it up and then hang it from a string from like, um, I've got it like on the inside of the porch and the wasps see that and they think, oh, there's already they're already occupied with a wasp nest. So that's a great trick um, so that you don't have to like remove a wasp nest, which can be a little tricky and scary. I ended up like having to jump off a ladder and my leg hurt for like a year after. Okay, so earthworms, they're our friends, the butterflies, the bees. Yes, you know, bees are said to pollinate three out of every four bites of food we eat. Okay, so, you know, what do we do about the garden pests? I'm sure that you've had multiple shows on this, but, you know, I um, have made a tea of onions, garlic, and cayenne pepper, strained it, and sprayed it on my plants. I've also... Um, used uh, Dr. Bronner's peppermint soap. I am a Dr. Bronner fan. I knew Dr. Bronner. Now I'm friends with his son and I'm in the movie about Dr. Bronner, Dr. Bronner's magic soap box. So check out the movie. It's kind of cute. I opened the movie. <laughs> um, but, you know, the, not all the pests are pests, you know, and they might serve a purpose. So we don't want to poison ourselves trying to get rid of pests. But we do know that ladybugs are great and that praying mantises are great, um, but a little Dr. Bronner's peppermint soaps diluted in water, okay, so it's not full strength. It's very, very diluted. Spray that on there. You will need to reapply it after a good rain. Um, and then here you can make a garden uh, pest spray. <clears throat> it's covered up so I can't see it, but you could use essential oils. And, you know, by the way, most essential oils repel bugs. You don't need to buy that DEET stuff like eucalyptus oil, lavender oil, rosemary oil, tea tree oil, uh, 
Uh, one of my friends found out that catnip oil also repels mosquitoes, but what she didn't tell us is that it attracts mountain lions because all cats like catnip. Okay, including the mountain lion. So don't use that by yourself when you're hiking alone. Um, you know, like use it downtown or at the beach, not where the mountain lions are. Okay, so there are natural alternatives. And, you know, another thing is when it comes to like natural products, even if it's your lotion or your shampoo or your soap, it means that somewhere on the face of the earth, you are supporting fields of lavender, fields of calendula, acres of aloe vera. I mean, isn't that what we want rather than some toxic chemical thing that, you know, has to have the skull and crossbones on the label? Like, don't do that. Okay. Um, so let's see a few edible weeds here in the top left is chickweed, Stellaria media. And chickweed is a very early spring plant. You'll even find it in the winter. <clears throat> and, um, yeah, all my guy friends have said, tell us more about the chickweed. We're looking for some chickweed. Okay, well, you know, that's another that's another story here. But chickweed has very tiny little white flowers. It's in the same family as carnation, and it's a delicious succulent plant. Um, when I say succulent, it's not really that succulent, but it's juicy. Let's say it's juicy. And calendu, I'm sorry, chickweed edible good in salads it also keeps for quite a while like if you pick a bunch of it and put it in your refrigerator it's still going to be good in two weeks so that's great chickweed is also used in salves so uh, if you need something to treat eczema or psoriasis or to heal a wound hey chickweed's your gal okay and then um, yeah i like to eat it it contains lecithin which is very nourishing for our brain and then right below the chickweed, the bottom left, is malva, malva neglecta. I bet you've seen this. Malva, look at the leaves there. It's a relative of hollyhock, as well as hibiscus and cotton and okra. So that ought to tell you something right there. Okra, you know, kind of slimy. Well, malva also has a little bit of that mucilage in it. That's kind of the friendly word for slimy. We call it mucilage. It's a lot prettier. Um, but it's like going to soothe the sore throat. It's going to soothe irritable bowels. Okay. There's nothing wrong with malva. Why buy lettuce when you could have malva that was growing five minutes ago? It's free. It's fresh. It's soothing. It's high in so many nutrients. Uh, mm -hmm, I'm really into that. So you can eat the flowers. You can eat the leaves. And then you can eat the little seed capsules, which are affectionately known as cheese wheels, because cheese used to come in round wheels. The little seed capsules of the chick of the malva <coughs> are edible. My granddaughter picked a bunch and we made pickles. All right. So in the middle there, we have lamb's quarter and lamb's quarter is wild spinach. So why would we pull this up? and go buy seeds for New Zealand spinach. We've been bamboozled, kids. I'm telling you, this is real. Lamb's quarter is going to be up a month. You could be eating it a month before you can plant spinach. So I want to share with you, anyone who knows me knows that I lived in a teepee for two and a half years uh, in the Ozarks and pretty much ate nothing but wild edible plants. Was I hungry? Absolutely. Was I skinny? You bet. Was I healthy? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, for some reason, I forgot that the Native Americans hunted. I forgot that. I must have blocked that out because we were of the Abby Hoffman school of thought, like if people kill what they eat and eat what they kill, there'd be no more war. And we kind of took that seriously. But anyways, Abby Hoffman, rest in peace. Um, but anyways, this I, I went to go help this old hillbilly woman who was a friend of the hippies. Mrs. Glore outlived three husbands and I went to like pull up the lamb's quarter to help her in her garden and she said this this is the words that changed my life she says well well well, well that there's lamb's quarter it's wild spinach and it's edible it's good for you and that changed my life because when I realized us hungry hippies back on the commune was that wow you can eat the weeds that means we're going to have three times more food than we thought. Awesome. So uh, right now I have in my dehydrator lamb's quarter chips. 
I harvested the lamb's quarter, uh, put a little olive oil and Celtic salt on it, and then I'm dehydrating them to make chips. And I'll tell you, it really satisfies you. We don't need to be buying those fried things that are fried in canola oil, okay? So lamb's quarter, I've made spanakopita with it. I've made a big salad tonight with rose petals. But anything you make with spinach. This morning we had green eggs, no ham, okay? All right, so the upper right is purslane. <clears throat> and I tell you that people will say, I oh, work so hard in the hot sun pulling up that purslane. And purslane is a wild version of portulaca, the beautiful garden flower. Purslane, it is a succulent, has um, reddish stems. It's very low growing to the ground, but it's really high in omega-3s, which is great for our brains. Okay, well, you can come see me at the pharmacy. I'll sell you a bottle of omega-3s, but I'm telling you, this is my preference to eat the purslane. It's also high in vitamin C. It makes a wonderful gazpacho. It makes a wonderful salad herb. It makes a great salsa, has sort of a sour flavor to it. Uber high in vitamin C and beta carotene. And then the bottom plant, uh, bottom right is, uh, it's, it's obviously a mint, but I'm gonna say it's lemon balm. Lemon balm, yeah, it can take over. I love those plants that take over. They grow no matter what. And so when everyone's garden is like, like uh, kind of tired, um, and you know, uh, hot and dry. A lot of these plants are still proliferating and providing food and medicine. When the those plants, we we eat mostly annual plants that are very fastidious. As soon as the frost comes, you know your tomatoes are done, your zucchini's done. But these plants just keep on giving. They're hardy. And one more thing about the lamb's quarter in the middle, the lamb's quarter will produce seeds that are edible, that are, it's a relative of quinoa and amaranth, and you can eat, uh, cook it like a grain. And you could even uh, grow microgreens in a tray of dirt in the winter with your lamb's quarter seeds. So to me, that's amazing. Okay, so edible flowers, if you're gonna plant flowers, why not plant something edible? We've talked about roses, but you know, nasturtium stuffed with guacamole, harebells, pansies are edible. You know, and very beautiful pansies will grow throughout the winter in many places. Um, Daylilies are amazing. Not only do they just bloom for a day, so you might as well eat them. You can dig up the daylily roots and cook them like potatoes. Wow, that's amazing. Um, what else do we have? Um, Again, we don't want to eat flowers from the flower shop. Calendula are edible. Uh, all your mint flowers, borage flowers. Borage uh, are said to give you courage. Borage gives you courage. So, uh, you know, zinnias. There's a lot of stuff you can eat. Marigolds. Now, I never put a whole flower on someone's plate. I tend to use them. I break them apart to make a design. If you put a whole rose on someone's plate, they're probably just going to think, you know, that's cute or it's just a decoration. But if you, you know, amalgamate it into the salad or put it on top of the casserole, I don't um, wash the flowers because I don't want, they kind of just get wilty if you wash them. I just put them uh, in the decoration. Um, I also don't cook them usually unless it's like making dandelion flower pancakes um, or elderflower muffins or something. But in general, I'm going to add the flowers at the end and not cook them. And flowers are the sex organs of plants. They are designed by the creator to attract, or maybe the life carriers, I would be corrected. <laughs> um, they are designed to attract pollinators with their beauty, their color, and their aroma. And maybe some of us would like to attract some pollinators to our dinner table. Really, edible flowers. Yes, I even had uh, Alex and Allison Gray come over for lunch one time, a couple of times actually, because I fed them amazing food. Like, I, you know, you make food like this and even the like rock stars and celebrated artists are going to want to show up at your dinner table. Tulips are edible. Wow, tulip stuff with guacamole. Mm -hmm. Violets, dandelions, and daylilies. 
uh, the bottom uh, left. <clears throat> I want to say with the day lilies, there's so many uh, hybrids of lilies. I would stick with Hemerocallis. Don't just like going tripping out on spider lily or, you know, I mean, there are some poisonous lilies, um, like uh, lily of the valley is very poisonous and death chemist is a lily. So we're going to stick with the orange Hemerocallis as an edible flower, but they're very delicious. And even the buds are edible. And in Asian medicine, day lily flowers and buds are considered a lung remedy. Okay, so we're gonna grow more culinary herbs. Some of these are easier to grow uh, from seedlings than seeds. So I just wanna be real with you. I have no, pro I mean, basil will grow easily from seeds, but uh, you know, thyme, lavender, rosemary, I'll probably buy a seedling, oregano, I usually get a seedling. But you know, this is also nice to share with your friends. You know, one way we can make this more affordable is to do seed share or have potlucks where people bring seeds or plants or root cuttings or divisions to share with one another. Um, rosemary, if you're gonna grow it in Canada, you'll have to bring it indoors for the winter. Um, grow it in a pot. And, uh, but lavender, well, I, it grow, it thrives all year long here in Colorado. Okay, so pollinator plants, we're gonna think about, you know, feeding the bees and the other pollinators. So those should also have priority. So, when, you know, be mindful in thinking about what shall we plant that can be part of the solution. Uh, two weeks ago, we held a bee in kind of like the subversive bee-ins of the 60s and 70s. Um, uh, th this was a bee-in to uh, raise awareness about the bees and we sold pollinator-friendly plants. This is something you may wanna do you know, in your community to raise awareness about the bees. We had someone come and teach how to make mead, um, talks on um, the different local bees, how to make beehives. So it's just a thought, but um, we're gonna keep doing it. This will, next year will be our third annual. Um, okay, I can't see what that says, but yeah. Flowers are beautiful and, uh, you know, think about things that are gonna grow in a diverse location, what you can plant under trees. So this might seem a little bit off the track, but in herbal medicine, Around the world, Chinese, India, Native American, European, la la la, you name it. There's a belief that the plants tell us what they're good for by the way they look and by the way they grow. And it, it's called the doctrine of signatures. Someone's waiting to be admitted again. So <clears throat> the doctrine of signatures, and I love this word signature because it has two words in it la signatura, the sign of nature. So the belief is that the, doc, the plants tell us what they're good for by the way they look and by the way they grow. Are you kidding me? No, I'm not kidding you. All right, so blueberries are really good for your eyes. They're good for brown eyes and green eyes as well as blue eyes. Kidney beans, what do you think they're good for? really they really are good for the kidneys seaweed is good for your hair wow okay let's see um seeds are good for your reproductive system celery is good for your bones what else can we say um cauliflower what do you think that's good for the brain yes it like it even has a brain stem I mean, that's amazing. And I mean, it's not really a myth because uh, the brain loves sulfur and that whole brassicaceae family, broccoli, cauliflower, cabbage, <clears throat> arugula, kale, they're all high in sulfur, great foods for the brain. So when my daughters were young and starting their menstrual cycles, I would always make them borscht, which is a Russian beet soup. Because is it a myth? Do beets build your blood? Absolutely. They look like blood. They build your blood. Don't worry. Don't go to the emergency room if your pee is pink the next day. Okay? It's okay. That happens sometimes. And this again, you know, seeds are good for reproduction. So if we only eat seeds that are roasted and salted, think about this. A raw sunflower seed can grow into a 10-foot tall plant. 
a roasted sunflower seed is going to rot in the ground. So which one? I think about this. Do you want to feel cooked, fried, baked, and toasted? Uh-huh. Think about that. I'm fried. I'm zapped. Like you've been in a microwave. Do you want to go in a microwave? No, of course not. So maybe you want to think about eating more living food, food that is raw, fresh, crisp, alive. I'm going for that. I, I'm not, I don't eat all raw food, but I do eat a lot of raw food. So have fun with that. Okay, teach our children well. Um, this is really, you know, the things we're talking about, the things that you do in your quadra island, gab about gardening. These are things that really should be taught in schools. Kids will eat what they learn to grow. You know, a kid who grows a carrot is going to eat a carrot. If they think it just comes from a store or a factory, it's just not as inspirational. So to, for getting kids to take part in the miracle is amazing. When my kids were little um, and they were inevitably going to say, Mom, I need some money, I would say we're going to go for a walk around the block. Maybe the next time we go for a walk around the other block. <clears throat> but I'd say I'll give you a quarter for every plant you can identify. 50 cents if you know the Latin name. A dollar if you can tell me three uses. So that really determined how much allowance they got. Yes. Was it bribery or was it rewarding? You know, because, hey, if you ever lost out there, I think we are so totally ill-prepared for what to do in an emergency. And there are emergencies happening all over the place. Rather than looking for the Garden of Eden, although I do know people who are very set on that, we should be creating Eden the best we can wherever we are. And that means growing things, uh, thinking about the community, not only of humans, but the creatures by giving back to the soil. Um, this is high-minded work. And I just applaud all of you for being part of growing things. Um, I did want to put a little plug in here. Uh, hemp can save the world. Uh, of all the plants that I know, and there's a lot that I know about, uh, cannabis can solve many, many of our environmental problems. We could be growing hemp and using the seed for food. It's not just about getting high. Uh, hemp seed is the second highest source of vegetable protein next to soybeans, but yet it's much easier to digest. And it won't get you high in case you were worried about that. Uh, Henry Ford made a car out of hemp. The body was made out of hemp fiber, and it was fueled with hemp seed oil. We need to be looking for renewable fuels, right? We could be growing our fuels rather than raping the land to extract them and fracking. You know, here in Colorado, we vote, we, I campaigned for it, but they voted. You can have a fracking well 500 feet from a house and 1,500 feet from a school. And that got passed because they kept advertising on TV Hey, if you like hot showers, you'll love fracking. Well, it's not a good thing when it comes to drinking water and animal life and gardening and all that. So just think about it. Hemp seed, you know what? In my yard, it just comes up wild. I mean, George Washington and Thomas Jefferson said, sow the hemp seed everywhere. And whether you smoke it or not, I juice the leaves, which also doesn't get you high. Not that I personally have anything against that. I just want to be straight. But um, hemp seed leaf juice is amazing. And I feel like a superhuman most of the time. Okay. Oh, the infinite be blessing and beauty of flowers. Yes, I love it. All right. I wrote a bunch of books. I did write a book um, called, I have a book called Dandelion Medicine. It's available as an e-book. Uh, this is, a Pol I think, a Polish version of it. It's in Chinese too, but America wasn't quite ready. So you can check me out, Brigitte Mars, on uh, YouTube. I have lots of articles. How much time do we have left, Miss Krisha? Uh, we have a half hour, Brigitte. So well, okay, I'm going to show you a, a little short video, maybe. Great. Right. I'm going to show a little short video. This is a movie we made. Um, it's only five minutes, and let's see here. Can you, is, is the screen black? Yep. Okay, all right, all right. Little movie called Long Gone.
free the plants, free the planet, free the plants, free the planet, free the plants, free the planet, power to the flowers. That horrible machine, it almost shredded one of my wings. Isn't there something you'd rather be doing on a beautiful sunny day like this than standing behind this smelly loud machine? Oh, sorry. So just think, you could save time, money, the air, the bees, water. You could eat healthier if you perhaps grew food here. It's a win-win situation for you, your neighbors, and all of creation. And if we could just get other people to do this, we could be part of a solution to making a healthier planet. Would you help me? I am so grateful. I would invite you to come visit me in my fairy realm. And I can show you some things we can do. Follow me. <coughs> Welcome to the fairy garden. Wow, this is amazing. I bet you know what this is called. It's a dandelion. Most people think this is a weed, but I want you to know that dandelion is one of the top five most nutritious plants on the face of the planet. You can eat the leaves, put them in a salad, put them in a juice. You can use them to make a quiche or spanakopita. And then the dandelion root, you can dig up and wash it and saute it or put it in a dehydrator. It's a delicious vegetable, but it also makes a great tea for cleaning our liver, our blood, and our skin. So we don't have to go far to find another great plant. Right here is lemon balm. Lemon balm is a member of the mint family. You can eat the leaves, you can eat the flowers, you can juice it, make it into a salad, a pesto. It is known as Melissa officinalis, and uh, Melissa means sweet leaf. Lemon balm is so medicinal, it has antiviral properties. It makes a delicious lemony tasting tea. Even children love it. That is a way we can be. Even this is a really important plant. It's called lamb's quarter. And the Latin name is kinopodium, which means goose's foot. I am so surprised that people will rip this out of their garden, get in the car, go to the store and buy spinach that is from another state or place on the planet when this is growing freely it tastes like spinach and it produces seeds in the fall that can be eaten like a grain mm. it is a relative of quinoa and amaranth we just need to learn how some of these weeds are really the ancestors of our cultivated vegetables and they grow a lot easier with less water and they grow much earlier and later than your cultivated plants. Mm. The humans need to rethink what they've been told. I personally think they've been bamboozled because nature is giving us free food and medicine everywhere. If we could only see their free food and medicine for you and for me because they lived on through the eons. A wheat is our precious plan who's yet to be understood. Yeah, let's get to know the weeds. Okay, thank you. And um, we can do questions or I have one uh, one like a three minute song. Should I do that and then we'll do questions? Yes, yes, indeed. Okay. So one more thing here. Oh, I think I have to go to share screen again. Uh 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 uh. Uh oh. Did I um sign myself out? Am I still there? Oh, I'm still there, right? You can still hear me, right? We can still hear you, and you're still co-host. Oh, okay, so here we go. Uh, 
I'm screen sharing. A new share. Here we go. New share. So we're going to do this. And so think of some good questions for us. Okay. Oops. No, we want you big. We want big. Ah, no, not that. Go away, silly. One moment while we iron out our technicalities. Yes, and while you're doing that, I want to remind everyone that gabbing about gardening is based on the gift economy. Brigitte Mars is one of the most phenomenal herbalists on the planet today. To have you with us, Brigitte, is such a great honor. Thank you so much. I'm wanting to remind everyone that this information is being given freely and in such a beautiful, vibrant, entertaining way. And we invite you and some of you have- Wait, stop, I'm stopping. Okay, sorry, go ahead. Some, some of you have uh, contributed. Your donations are the only way that we continue to give an honorarium to our guest teachers. I think this presentation has spoken for itself. It's perhaps, it is indeed the best presentation on herbal medicine and plants that we can grow in our gardens that I have ever seen. So I will drop the uh, e-transfer information, your donations in the chat box, your donations go to our guest teacher of the of the week of the day and we also sponsor a wide variety of permaculture schools and gardening education programs around the world including the Kenyan refugee settlement that is being organized has been organized for by Moray Gamble. So just a reminder that gabbing about gardening is based on the gift economy. And I will drop that information in the chat box. It's all yours now, Brigitte. Thank you so much. So um, this is a song that my partner has written and produced and, but she got all the information out of my, my book. Um, and I think this is just so important. So I'm just gonna, um, let you hear this because it's very informational. Oh, 
Lifting, Brigitte, thank you for joining us and speaking your truth with such beauty and kindness. And thank you so much. I've wanted, I've wanted to do this with you for so long, so I'm so glad we can. And I know um, we've been planning this for years, and this is fabulous. I'm so glad that it's recorded our time here <clears throat> together because there's such a concentration of important information. Let's get to a couple of questions. Uh, Lynn is asking about plants to decrease inflammation, Brigitte. What do you suggest we grow? Well, it's always good to look at what's causing the inflammation rather than just decreasing it. And very often, you know, it's said that a th about a th one to two thirds of the average diet is uh, gluten and wheat. So, you know, are you eating something that's causing inflammation, sugar, wheat, dairy? You know, very often we become addicted to things that we're allergic to. So it's always good to look at that. And the good news is that what decreases inflammation are enzymes. And enzymes are in food that has not been heated to over 114 degrees. So I would say green leafy vegetables. I would say do your best to have... A, you know, green salad once a day and a green juice once a day. And I make juice in the blender. I just stuff the, bl this is something you all can do. I stuff my blender with weeds, lemon balm, mint, lamb's quarter, purslane, dandelion greens, nettles. And then I uh, fill the blender with water. And then I add an apple and maybe half a lemon or lime, put the lid on and blend it up. So granted, there's a lot of water in there, but who has time to get that juicer out? It's got like 50 million parts. So I blend it all up and then I strain it through a paint strainer bag. And the uh, the life force that I get from drinking a juice where things were growing like two minutes before, you can't get that at the store. There's nothing at the store that was growing two minutes ago. So I'm really telling you, this is a way to make yourself feel amazing. So one green salad a day, one green juice a day. I mean, we certainly know that foods like a papaya and pineapple, which certainly don't grow in Canada, are good for reducing inflammation. Um, turmeric and ginger are two herbs. I don't think turmeric will grow in Canada. Probably you only have wild ginger. So I'm going to say um, our greens. Most things are going to be anti-inflammatory, but we need to look at what's causing the inflammation. Fried foods, chips, um, you know. Well, this is from Lynn, and she's saying she's a no gluten, a no wheat, no dairy. We do have a lot of wild berries right now. I know you're a wild food advocate, so am I, you know, as well as the cultivated ones. Strawberries, uh, raspberries are coming on. So the salmon berries and the huckleberries are just fabulous right now. So you're saying just stuff the blender full of the wild foods you're talking about and some of the cultivated ones we have in the garden as well and drink her down. 
Yeah, I fill the blend uh, with water and I add an apple and half a lemon or lime for flavor. I actually include the peel because lemon and lime peel contain limonene, which has some anti-cancer properties. So I blend it all up and then I strain it through a paint strainer bag. Don't use cheesecloth. I'm going to use a paint strainer bag, which can take like squeezing it. And then I compost the pulp. Um, and so that's a great way. And then, you know, you mentioned strawberries are anti-inflammatory. Um, cold water, deep sea fish is going to be anti-inflammatory. But, you know, it may be that taking some type of um, enzyme, if you buy enzymes at the health food store, if you take them with a meal, they help you digest your food. If you take them between a meal, they reduce inflammation. But I'm going to say, you know, your green leafy things. However, things that are really high in oxalic acid, like spinach might not be your best bet. Um, you know, lettuce, celery are great anti-inflammatory agents as well. Thank you for your wonderful question. I'm glad you're already gluten and dairy-free because they're problems for a lot of people. Well, a good point on the oxalic acid. Thank you for that reminder. Now, before um, today, I actually got a message from a gentleman on our Gabbing About Gardening Facebook page. And he was asking me to ask you, Brigitte, how to get rid of toenail fungus. And well, you I mentioned it when you were talking things. about the root of the Oregon grape, I think. Yeah, well, you know, again, uh, toenail fungus, it may be good to cut back on things that feed fungus like sugar, alcohol, bread, um, and then consider taking a probiotic supplement because rather than killing the fungus, you outnumber the bad guys. You know, I would say wear natural fiber socks, alternate your shoes every other day. Don't wear the same shoes day after day. Wear natural fiber shoes as well, not plasticky shoes that make you sweat inside. But my favorite thing for toenail fungus is to soak your feet in half water and half apple cider vinegar, and then apply a combination of half lavender oil and half tea tree oil. You'll probably need to use something really concentrated like an essential oil. Um, even though Oregon grapefruit is antimicrobial, um, you want to do something topically. And that's what I usually see that works well. Thank you. That sounds great. I will, I will let him know about that. Now, I wanted to check in with you um, on brain power. You know, we're all at this, well, some of us, I see some younger folk here too, um, are really wanting to boost our brain power, or at least keep what we have. What are some of the plants that you've talked about today that we can plant and grow and incorporate? And then after you answer that, Brigitte, we have a, a question about lamb's quarter seeds and if there are saponins in them. Okay, well, um, so thanks for our brain. Our brain loves chlorophyll, which is all your greens. Um, our brains also love it when we get enough protein. So protein can be things like sunflower seeds, pumpkin seeds, tofu beans. It could be eggs. Um, but, you know, I, I could say, you know, animal protein, but I also want to say I do think that you know, um, I think people just like hunters would kill an animal and eat the parts of the animal, like the heart to give them courage or the liver to give them strength or something like that. I think that when people eat commercial animals, they are perhaps picking up on the depression and the anxiety and the fear that they have. So if you do eat animal products, you want to do your best and support righteous, you know, farmers that are doing, you know, the, the kindest animal husbandry possible. Um, but brain foods, we've talked about cabbage, we've talked about cauliflower, a head of cabbage. See, that's the doctrine of signature. Um, I also think of black foods being really good for the brain. So in Asian medicine, um, the brain is the health of the brain is governed by the kidneys so if you're concerned about your brain uh, you better not be cooking with aluminum cookware and what do i mean by black foods black berries black rice or wild rice black beans black sesame seeds black 
uh, chia seeds. That's one of my favorite super brain foods. Soak chia seeds overnight in water and then add, uh, you could add service berries or blueberries to them. Blueberries are really good for the brain. The blueberries and all of those blue foods contain something called anthocyanins or proanthocyanidins that increase peripheral circulation to your brain, your eyes, and your ears, and your toes. So blueberries are also good for like diabetic retinopathy and poor circulation to the feet and the hands. Um, and I would assume service berries are too, although I don't think they've been as researched. But, you know, I'm according to the doctrine of signatures, that ancient wisdom, they're going to be good too. <clears throat> and of course, some of the other herbs good for the brain are uh, ginkgo biloba, the leaves of the ginkgo biloba plant, as well as <coughs> an herb called gotu cola, which you can grow as a house plant. And one more plant, uh, an Ayurvedic herb called bacopa, B-A-C-O-P-A. -A. But I'm really big on having a day planner and writing things down. So when you, you know when you get to be, I don't know, maybe over 35 or something, you need more RAM on your hard drive. And a great way to do that is to have a book where you write it all down because how many of us forget things? I forgot that appointment. When's that party? Is it potluck? What was the address? Is the appointment a two or three? Like, don't stress yourself out. Don't fill your mind with that clutter. Get yourself a book and write everything down that you say you're going to do. Or you get a great thought. I really, I, to me, I think that's a real key to a successful life. All my apprentices have a law of attraction day planner. It's a requirement. <laughs> I love it. Well, I, I, as you're speaking, of course, it's all Perfect. going in the book. <laughs> yep. But really. that's what recording is for, too. I mean, one of the reasons I just love doing the gabbing about gardening sessions with people as knowledgeable as you and entertaining as you is we get to watch it over and over again. So thank, thank you so much for doing that. Hey, I was so delighted to see so many beautiful native plants in, in your lineup and also wanted to shout out on the One Straw Revolution book as well. It's been one of my guiding lights in gardening. And I wondered if you could just speak to what it was about that book that you love so much and then Tell us about one of your favorite books that you've written. What is what is the first book we should start with to stay in touch with what you're teaching? Okay. Well, I did want to answer. Um, I'm not sure if Lamb's Quarter Seed contains saponin. Oh, right. I've not noticed that they're soapy the way quinoa is. Um, so I don't really know. It's possible that they are. So if you're, you know, it wouldn't hurt to give them a rinse, but I know that when you rinse quinoa, it really does have a, a lot of saponins and lather in it. Yucca has saponins, so it might have some, but I don't know if that research has been done um, or that I just don't have access to that. So a couple resources I want to say is I have a phone app. <clears throat> it's called iPlant. iPlant, letter I, plant with Brigitte Mars. And it works for iPhone and Android. And a couple of Mormon Navy SEALs um, turned one of my books into a phone app. So the the book that a lot of, so that's a book that'll tell you the chemical constituents of everything. But one book that gardeners might like is the Desktop Guide to Herbal Medicine. So the Desktop Guide to Herbal Medicine is going to tell you like, well, what's this plant about? You know, is it safe for pregnant women? Is it safe for high blood pressure? Um, you know, it's going to answer all those questions. Does it have tannins in it? Does it have uh, saponins in it? All that will be in that book. Um, and then the other book that I think a lot of you might like is The Country Almanac of Home Remedies because it's all full of folk remedies. You know, as I said, I had a French-Canadian grandmother, and, you know, a lot of her remedies were things that came out of her pantry. What can you do with honey? Um, what can you do with lemon juice? What can you do with apple cider vinegar? Matter of fact, you can treat like a hundred things with apple cider vinegar and uh, honey stirred into a cup of warm water. I'm not gonna capitalize. I'm, okay, remedies, hopefully. Remedies, I, I, I misspelled it. Okay, I'll, I'll do it right. Remedies, okay. Um, 
<clears throat> so that book, The Country Almanac of Home Remedies, is full of things you can do with lemon, vinegar, garlic, onion, uh, things that you probably already have in your kitchen, cinnamon, ginger. And I really love that because, you know, sometimes stuff happens in the middle of the night and you don't want to, like, be running to the store. The health food stores are closed anyway. So, um, and I really wanted to honor my grandmother in this folk remedy wisdom. And, you know, during this time of the, the virus, um, I really just want to say garlic and oregano are a couple really big allies. You know, raw garlic is more medicinal than cooked garlic. So garlic bread isn't going to do it. But one of my things to use when feeling under the weather is a uh, baked sweet potato with l lots of raw garlic and maybe olive oil or coconut oil in it. I feel like that's so great if you feel like I'm coming down with a, a cold or flu or something like that. Oh, yummy. Thank you for that reminder. I'm sure all of us or most of us have garlic that we'll be harvesting in the next couple of months and certainly oregano. We can grow uh, rosemary, lavender, oregano year round on our islands because we're a very temperate rainforest area, Brigitte. We're not the boreal forest. Um, oh, lovely. So, yeah, it, it is lovely. A lot of those Mediterranean herbs are very easy to grow in our area, especially as things get drier and drier. So check out Brigitte Mars's iPlant app. Check out the desktop guide to herbal medicine. And check out the Country Almanac of Home Remedies. Just check out BrigitteMars.com. You cannot go wrong. You're going to find something that is absolutely perfect for you in your life right now and Brigitte is not only a great teacher she is a great healer and she does private you still do private consultations I, I, do I, private. I do zoom calls with people all around the world and I'm also an end of life doula wow I did so, not know that beautiful thank you thank you just one last question on the lambs quarters from Carol. Actually, Carol has two comments that she's really happy to share this recording with friends and relatives in the city. Thanks, Carol. And does lambs quarters have oxalic acid like spinach? Um, yes, it does have some. And I don't think that you want to diss it because of that. So what oxalic acid uh, does is it inhibits calcium absorption but lamb's quarter also has a lot of calcium in it too. And it's really a ratio thing. So, you know, I think it's good to vary what you do. I'm a big believer in eating all the different colors of the rainbow. You know, I'm not going to have lamb's quarter every day, but you know, while it's in season, I'm going to do that. And then, you know, chickweed is another one and violet. So you kind of vary it, but yes, I do know lamb's quarter has oxalic acid. So I know our time is up and I want to thank all of you for showing up and gardening. What a beautiful thing. Uh, Lou, Lucretia, a dear old friend. I hope we get to hang out again. Um, many, many blessings to you and all your listeners. Oh, thank you, Brigitte. I'm really struck by your words. Weeds are the ancestors of our cultivated plants. I'd love to keep moving forward with that idea. Next week on Gapping About Gardening, we're gonna just gab with each other about our own gardens. Tomorrow on the Gabbing About Gardening radio show, and Brigitte is also a guest on that show on occasion, we have Dr. Nancy Turner helping us to celebrate National Indigenous Peoples Day in Canada. We also have seed saver Dan Jason from Salt Spring Island, and our homestead mama, Jennifer Bankstall, that's tomorrow morning on the radio show. We'll have a podcast. You can listen to that if you don't get onto the Cortez Radio CKT said 89.5 FM. And thank you again to Brigitte. We'd like parting words of wisdom. Barbara is saying many, many thanks, Brigitte, and always Lou. Thank you, Barbara. Thank you to Bethy Lovelight, your beautiful partner, life partner, for her contribution to this with her lovely music. What are your parting words of wisdom as we move forward? What is your blessing to us? Uh, my blessing, well, my parting words, I think I've said them, 
Um, but I, I will say again, learn to eat the weeds. They are hardier than our cultivated vegetables. They are the ancestors. Even the thistle is the ancestor to artichoke. So if we just t take time to listen, I think in this perilous world with chemtrails and virus and, uh, you know, fracking and 5G and all the stuff that's coming down the pipes, um, the weeds adapt and we need to be like the weeds. We need to adapt and by eating them, we can adapt and imbibe that adaptability quality. That's what I'm counting on. Thanks again. I love Thank it. You Thank day. you. Bye-bye. Thank you everyone for joining Gabbing About Gardening. It's a delight to see you all. We'll see you next week, same time, same place. Now go outside and get dirty. Bye-bye. <laughs> Thank you. Bless you. Thank you, my dear. Lovely to be with you. Bye-bye.